even if we take all those implied hydrogens that we added to the structure of diazepam when we were analyzing this fine line structure earlier and erase them all, we're still kind of left with the question of what matters here? What is important? What should I be looking at? What should my eye be drawn to? When you're just starting out with your studies of organic chemistry, this can be a very difficult question to answer. And the subject of this video is one concept that's going to help you orient yourself to see molecules in the right way. It's known as a functional group. A functional group is a collection of atoms within an organic compound with transferable properties and reactivity. So when that same sort of substructure, structure within a structure, shows up across multiple molecules, we can take reactivity and properties we've seen in one compound and transfer it to the other compound. And we can think of pretty much any organic molecule as a set of functional groups sort of decorating or latched onto a carbon skeleton. So in a structure like diazepam, the functional groups, as we'll see here in a second, are primarily things containing pi bonds and heteroatoms, things like the CN double bond, the CO double bond, and this nitrogen linked to that CO double bond is part of that functional group. This ring of alternating single and double bonds, actually both of these rings, are the same functional group showing up twice within an organic structure. The CH2 is just kind of a skeletal carbon. It's not doing much, not necessarily part of a functional group. It's just there to sort of hold things together. Where our eye should really be drawn are these heteroatoms and lone pairs. That's where the action occurs in diazepam, and these are the functional groups. What exactly is a functional group? Well, a functional group is a characteristic groups of, group of atoms and bonds within a molecule that has predictable and transferable properties in reactivity across different molecules. So we can recognize that collection of atoms in a diverse array of organic compounds and use what we already know about the reactivity and properties of that collection of atoms in one molecule to infer its reactivity and properties in another molecule. This is the beauty of functional groups. And we can envisage or envision any organic compound as a set of functional groups decorating a carbon skeleton with saturated carbons with only single CC and CH bonds. For example, here we've got two examples of compounds that contain carbon-carbon double bonds. And these are functional groups. This is an important functional group known as the alkene. And in fact, functional groups are typically characterized by either or both pi bonds and or heteroatoms. Heteroatoms, again, being nitrogen, oxygen, halogens, sulfur, phosphorus, any atom that is not carbon or hydrogen is known as a heteroatom. Where you see those and you see pi bonds, including pi bonds between carbons, carbon-carbon double and triple bonds, you're generally looking at a functional group. The particular example on this slide is known as an alkene. This is the name of the carbon-carbon double bond functional group. These are alkenes. And these alkenes are showing up attached to two different kinds of carbon skeletons, right? Saturated carbon skeletons. Here we have a six-membered ring with four carbons kind of tethering the ends of the carbon-carbon double bond together. And here we have a chain of saturated carbons and a couple of methyl groups with the alkenes sort of in the middle connecting these two groups of saturated carbon atoms. The saturated carbons are more or less unreactive, which is why we tend to ignore them. Now, if you look at modern organic chemical research, turning the CH bond into a reactive functional group is a huge part of modern organic chemical research. But for our purposes, generally these unactivated, saturated CH bonds are unreactive. Okay, so why is recognizing that alkene useful? Well, both of these alkenes undergo the same types of reactions. For example, if we hit them with hydrogen gas and a platinum catalyst, the alkene is hydrogenated, H2 is added, the elements of H2 are added, to form saturated products. Notice that the double bond has disappeared, and not only has the double bond disappeared, we've gone from two CH groups in the CC double bond to two CH2 groups. Think about the implied hydrogens here, a good example of the helpfulness of drawing in and thinking about implied hydrogens. So this is a hydrogenation reaction. The elements of hydrogen have been added to the alkenes. And this is a characteristic reaction of alkenes. This is something that all alkenes engage in more or less with various rates, right, faster or slower. But we can think about hydrogenating any alkene, pretty much, that we find within an organic compound. 
And this, this transferability, that's the beauty of recognizing and using the functional group approach. When we see an alkene in this compound, cyclohexene, we can infer the same reactivity and similar properties in a molecule like this that also has that carbon-carbon double bond. This slide shows Table 2.1 from the Klein 3rd edition text, and it's just a survey of some common functional groups. I'm not going to go through these in detail, but I do want to point a couple of things out. First of all, R. This symbol R that you'll see in organic molecules, especially when you're first encountering structures and reactions, is a general symbol representing a saturated hydrocarbon group generally. It doesn't have to be saturated, actually. It could contain double or triple bonds, but it's some hydrocarbon group. That means a heteroatom is not what's connected to the functional group. So for example, here if we look at the ketone, these Rs represent carbons with connected hydrogens and maybe other carbons, other atoms, but the key is R implies that a carbon atom is connected to the functional group. And in this case, that functional group is this CO double bond, the carbonyl group, connected to two hydrocarbon or carbon groups. So there is a huge variety of uh, functional groups in organic chemistry. And so there's, there's no reason for us to cover them all at this point. But some things I do want to point out is that you'll see a lot of heteroatoms and similar types of heteroatoms tend to go together. So for example, we can talk about alkyl halides, which encompass organochlorides, organobromides, organofluorides, and organoiodides, right? And an example of an organochloride, an alkyl, fluoride is shown right here, but we can sort of put all of those into one bucket in the alkyl halide umbrella. We, so we see a lot of heteroatoms. We see pi bonds, double bonds, triple bonds between carbon carbon, as well as carbon heteroatom double and triple bonds, the CO double bond showing up over and over and over again. And notice that functional groups will often encompass more than just two atoms. So the carboxylic acid, for example, is really characterized by this four-atom carboxyl group with an OH group linked to the CO double bond or, or carbonyl group. And we'll learn to recognize when we sort of want to broaden our view of a functional group to include more than just one or two atoms. It tends to happen when resonance as in play, is in play, as we'll touch on here in a second. Here are a few more examples of some common functional groups. And one thing I would point out here is, again, this idea that similar types of atoms are associated with similar functional groups. The thiol, which is RSH, has an SH group linked to some hydrocarbon group, is, is quite similar to the alcohol in many ways, ROH. Sulfur and oxygen are in the same group of the periodic table, and so we can even use ideas that we're familiar with, for example, from the chemistry of alcohols to reason about the chemistry of thiols. That kind of transferable reasoning and reasoning by analogy is something we're going to do throughout this course and throughout your Organic Chemistry 2 course as well. Now, before we leave this discussion of functional groups, I do want to emphasize a couple of things. Functional groups are helpful, as we've discussed, for helping you see organic molecules, but they're also helpful for talking about and thinking about organic molecules. How do you communicate about a particular part of a molecule that's doing the interesting business? Using the language of functional groups and these terms for the various functional groups is helpful to do that. It's an organizing principle for organic chemistry as well. Functional groups do reactions that are transferable. So we can talk about the reactions of a particular functional group, and this gives us insight into a broad array of compounds. And so the, the moral of the story, really, of all this, and, and the, the upshot is not to memorize the names of functional groups. It's much more important to recognize the parts of molecules that are functional groups as opposed to memorizing their names. Building familiarity with the names will help you. There's no question about that. But generally speaking, it's not necessary to set out to deliberately memorize the names of organic functional groups. That's going to happen naturally as you dive into the study of organic chemistry. Here we're going to work through an example where we recognize and identify and label the functional groups in two compounds used in the treatment of heart disease, enalapril and atenolol. And we're going to use Table 2.1 on the slides and in the textbook to label these functional groups. Don't memorize the names. 
The most important thing really is to learn to see where the functional groups are located within these molecules, looking for those pi bonds and heteroatoms that are a signal that, hey, I'm looking at a functional group. The first thing I've done is added implied lone pairs to each of these structures, since thinking about the lone pairs when we're thinking about the properties and reactivity of the functional group is going to be very important. And it may be worth pausing and verifying that the number of lone pairs at each heteroatom is correct here if you want more practice with drawing implied lone pairs. All right, let's dig into finding the functional groups. Before we name, I actually want to recognize the functional groups first. So how do we do that? Well, we're looking for collections of heteroatoms and pi bonds that sort of go together. And if you're familiar with resonance, wherever resonance is in play, we tend to lump all those atoms together into a single functional group. So for example here, if this is unfamiliar, we'll tackle this a little bit later, so don't worry too much. The oxygens, the two oxygens, the O and the OH group and the central carbon are all resonance active. There's resonance delocalization within this unit, this substructure highlighted in orange. That's one functional group. Something similar is happening with this portion highlighted in red. The nitrogen, the adjacent carbon, and that doubly bonded oxygen are all engaged in resonance. There's delocalization in that portion of the structure. We see a heteroatom next, that NH is heteroatom, nitrogen, right? And that's going to be a functional group. The alternating double and single bonds in a six-membered ring. We've seen this before. This is a functional group, as is the collection of O, double bond C, single bond O atoms in the bottom right. Actually, that bottom right structure highlighted in green looks very similar to what we highlighted in orange before. The only difference is an H here where there's a carbon group here. So these are the functional groups in this molecule, and we recognize these by looking for pi bonds and lone pairs. And if you struggled with, for example, lumping all of these together and maybe notice that, oh, this is a CO double bond, that's a functional group, it's a carbonyl group, that's good. Once we dig into recognizing re resonance in molecules, you'll get much better at lumping resonance active functional groups, um, atoms involved in a single functional group together. Okay, so what are the names? Well, here we're going to use table 2.1. I actually encourage you to pull this up in your textbook as we're going through this. I'm going to do it from memory just because I can and I have it here, but absolutely use table 2.1 if you need to. There's no shame in using this table at this point, and you'll have it available where you need it as far as I'm concerned in Chem 2311. So the group highlighted in orange is known as a carboxylic acid. The group in red is an amide. The nitrogen with two saturated sp3 hybridized carbon groups linked to the nitrogen as well as the H is known as an amine. The green structure here with a CO double bond with a linked what we call alkoxy group, O linked to an alkyl group, and a saturated carbon over here is known as an ester. And then the alternating single and double bonds, that's known as an aromatic ring or an arene. In particular, the six-membered alternating single and double bond structure is known as a benzene ring. All right, so let's do the same thing for atenolol. We can recognize in atenolol a number of heteroatoms. These are going to be associated with functional groups. And we actually see an example of a functional group that is also present in enalapril, this bit here with a CO double bond, an attached nitrogen group, and an attached carbon group. This is an amide. Let's start on the left-hand side of the molecule, though. Here we have a group we've also seen before, nitrogen connected to two saturated carbons and an H. This is an example of an amine. The OH here, that's the hydroxyl group. And when a hydroxyl group is connected to a saturated carbon, that is the alcohol functional group. An oxygen connected by two single bonds to two carbon groups is known as an ether. That's highlighted here in blue. We have an arene in the center of the molecule. Six-membered ring, alternating single and double bonds. That's a benzene ring, again. And then on the far right, we have the amide, which is very similar to the amide found in enalapril. And again, just to drive this point home about functional groups, we would expect the behavior of the amide in atenolol to be at least qualitatively similar to the behavior and properties of the amide in enalapril. For example, they might have similar basicities, for instance.